You're listening to the Yeshiva of Newark at IDT podcast. I'm your host and curator, Rabbi Aprom Kipolevich, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Clear the aisles. The projectionist has smicha. Hi. I'm here with Yusuf Kowalkowski, and, you know, I'm not sure if a person has to die to uh, sort of uh, think about him and think about what they did. Um, if they were significant, you could talk about their significance, you know, not necessarily in the week after they died or, or right after they died, but I guess it's human nature, right? You talk to, uh, to sort of, you know, jar our memory when we hear somebody has passed, even though the person has been out of it for years. So I, I guess in the last week, uh, as we're recording this, uh, we have the deaths of uh, a number of uh, people that were involved in uh, what this program is about, which is about old old movies and vintage TV. And uh, one of them is one of the is probably would love in his Ayu Ma'emis uh, to be hearing this because he was all about Darshning. Um, and that's one of the people who died this past week, Peter Bogdanovich, who was probably the biggest Darshaner I know about uh old old movies i i think he's probably he probably sets the record for the amount of uh, uh essays and interviews and schmoozing and talking and uh writing that he did about old movies and uh, not so much about tv which he says his parents didn't even have a television when he was growing up but he definitely is a lover of old movies so we're going to talk a little bit about peter rodonovich and and his legacy uh, and a couple of very important uh, contributions he made, um, and, and you know we're not going to we're not going to spare him some criticism. We also want to also talk about um, uh, another person who passed away this week, um, and I know this is close to your heart. Is the former child actor who actually was a not really a teen actor, but it was very well known for his uh, for his teenage roles, uh, Dwayne Hickman. Uh, the uh, the the title character of the program known officially as the Many Loves of Dobie Gillis, but most people just know it as the Dobie Gillis Show, right? That's uh, that's Dwayne Hickman, and we also, I guess, could also uh, you know throw in a mention of someone that we I, I think we highlighted a couple of weeks ago, uh, Sidney Poitier, uh, who died uh, this week as well. So. Let, let's start with with Bogdanovich, um, and and in a way, you know, Bogdanovich, uh, uh, like I said, he is sort of uh, a movie rat, sort of like both of us in a way. Um, you know, growing up as a, as a kid and gravitating towards old films. Um, you know, he said a, a wonderful comment that he made. He said, "People don't say they're going to hear, hear an old concert if they're going to hear, uh, you know." Uh, the 1812 Overture, or if they're going to hear the Messiah, or if they're going to hear um, you know, Beethoven's Fifth or Ninth, they basically say, yeah, I'm going to hear Beethoven, I'm going to hear Mozart. People should feel the same way when it comes to film, especially if it's a if it's an achievement that we know has significance and can last. Um, but he was someone who was zeroing in his whole life towards films, and uh, um, he was obsessive about it. Um, he grew up in Kingston, New York, not far from where you are, Yitzchak, and um, you know, in the theater there that his dad took him. His, his mother is Jewish. His mother was Jewish. Uh, his dad was Serbian, not not, not a Jew, a Bogdan, uh, Bogdanovich, some Bogdan, <laughs> some some old Bogdan in the past was somehow his grandfather, but on his mother's side, he was a Jew. Uh, and obviously, uh, as, as far as we're concerned, halachi Jew. But his interest, you know, I, I don't know if he made any film that that openly dealt with Judaism, but he uh, was clearly an artistic boy and someone who cared a lot about art and wrote. Even as a as a youngster, he wrote very intelligently and uh, to the point about all these movies that he that he that he saw. He kept a, a whole. A, a stack of note cards of every single movie he ever saw, and he organized them. He had them, um, and somehow, you know, when he moved to, to New York, he got involved in theater. Uh, he was just like one of his heroes, and eventually one of his closest friends, Orson Welles. He was involved in, just as a teenager in, in theater, just like Orson Welles was involved in the Mercury Theater. He was uh, actually a director and an, an actor, and then a director. Uh, of theater and off Broadway, um, and uh, um, in the in the sixties, he started writing 
in the early 60s, he started writing for Esquire magazine uh, and became a curator uh, in the Museum of Modern Art for retrospectives for Orson Welles and Alfred Hitchcock and, and John Ford, uh, people that we've extolled here as well. And uh, as a curator, he this was like very new. Today, everybody does, uh, you can do museum things about everyone. Uh, but this was so very new at the time. Um, he brought an enthusiasm, a love of film, an understanding of how it was done. Um, not just, hey, I like seeing a movie. He, he really was into the nitty gritty. He also understood about actors and directing. Uh, and I think in 1965 or 66, when he moved out to California, he met Roger Corman and, um, you know, they hit it off. Roger Corman appreciated films. He made schlocky movies, but he appreciated films. He appreciated great movies. He appreciated the type of writing that Bogdanovich did. And had it not been for Roger Corman, we don't know if Bogdanovich would have really become the filmmaker he became because Corman gave him. Uh, a number of jobs to do, a number of rewrites to do, um, some uh, second unit directing, maybe even, you know, some prime directing and editing stuff that he was learning on some of the Corman films, the films with the, it's one of these biker films that Corman made. I'm sure you know what it is, but the, um, the angels, um, the angels in the desert or something like that. I, I forgot the name of the film, but, but he was, it was the one that I think it was Peter Fonda's one of his first films. And, um, you know, he, uh, Corman eventually uh, uh, came to him after the great work that he did. Uh, Corman said, hey, how would you like to direct your own movie? And Corman uh, gave him uh, a, a, a hand in directing uh, and, uh, to direct a film that he would have to sort of create the, the movie. And we've talked about this. I, I told you how funny this was because Corman had had a relationship with all the great old Hollywood uh, characters including Boris Karloff, who uh, he made a film with Karloff uh, called The Terror. And Karloff still owed him. I guess he paid him enough money that Karloff owed him two days of work. So he told, uh, Cor uh, Corman told Bogdanovich, you know, and Bogdanovich at this point, you know, was, uh, you know, in his, his, you know, not yet even 30 years old. Uh, he told him, look, um, look, in two days, I've made whole movies in two days. You should be able to get at least uh, 20 minutes a film with uh, Karloff. You have two days to work with him. Uh, and you can use all this footage from this movie called The Terror, where you could also somehow insert in the film. Plus, do what else, do what else, do, do what you want with the other stuff. And, you know, whatever it's going to cost, I've got a little bit of a bankroll. And, you know, put those things together. And somehow Bogdanovich came up with a, a brilliant idea. Um, he was helped by Sam Fuller, another great Jewish director. And he came up with, with, with a movie called Targets, which I haven't been able to see, but I've, I know enough about it. And I, I, I think you know a little bit about it, too. It, it's, I think it might have been Karloff's last role. Um, and his last. He, he made quite a few that year just before he died. Just before he died. So it might have been one of his last. Uh, and, and he plays sort of himself. He plays a character called Basil Orlock. Uh, if you didn't get it, then it's Boris Karloff. Um, and uh, he's actually, you know, uh, making fun of this terrible movie called The Terror that, <laughs> that he had made with Corman. And somehow part of the film is the fact that The Terror is going to be playing in some drive-in theater. And what what Bogdanovich came up with, I guess with Fuller's help, is the idea of interlacing old horror with the new horror that had already uh, reared its head in 1966. Charles Whitman standing on the top of the, um, uh, the tower in Austin, Texas at the university and picking people off um, you know, out in the street. Uh, I've already, as you remember, recommended the, uh, the, 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 anim the animated uh, production called um tower which is a great animation film which i've already talked about which people can can find if they can but this was sort of a uh, using charles whitman's ugly horrible life of the day he did those sniper killings uh to the point of uh i forgot who the actor that bogdanovich used but that actor was uh, going to be involved in you know sniping off people and shooting people uh and 
Karloff was going to be like the the sage who indicates that the old type of Victorian horror film that the terror was supposed to be doesn't scare anyone anymore because we've got scarier things out there that people who are just being picked off by insane snipers who, who, who butcher their family and then you know kill people indiscriminately. Um, I think that's the basic theme of the film, um, but it, it got enough reviews. And of course, Bogdanovich had to push himself to push this film because nobody wanted to distribute it. And, and he was able to somehow get enough critics to see it that it was lauded by the New York Times and other reviewers. And there, Bogdanovich people said, hey, this guy's got something. Um, and he'd already become, of course, friends with Orson Welles and many of the other names that he could drop in, in, in Hobbit. Orson Welles was not such a great name to drop. But somehow he was able to get uh, the, the backing to, in 1971 to, uh, to film uh, a, uh, a adaptation of a novel by Larry McMurtry called The Last Picture Show. And, um, uh, you know, this was a film that I remember very distinctly when it came out. Um, it was rated R, and I'm not going to recommend uh, a- as a pick. I can tell you that it is a-, a startling, beautiful film in black and white. Uh, Wells advised him to do it in black and white. It's about, of course, a dying town in the 1950s in Texas. And it's really about the idea of how the world had begun to change uh, in 1950 or so. Um, and how old ideals about the West and about nobility um, really have faded away completely, about the emptiness of modern life and when it began. Uh, it had incredible performances, really. And again, it, it, it notched an Oscar um, for uh, Ben Johnson, who was one of John Ford's uh, usual road crew in, in some, many of his films. Not road crew, meaning he was part of the people that played parts in Johnson and John Ford's films. And Cloris Leachman, um, who, you know, at the same time, I think she was playing uh, Phyllis on the Mary Tyler Moore show, a program that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Uh, she was uh, doing a, an incredible dramatic um piece in in the last picture show where she plays Ruth Poppers um you know a desperate 40 something year old woman who's desperate just for some love and affection and wherever she can find even from a teenager um the films the films a coming of age uh but it, it, it just you know it's so stark and beautiful um that people I think are correct when they say it's you know you know one of the greatest um uh, films by a young American director since Citizen Kane. Now, after that film, he made, uh, he was, he had such carte blanche, uh, you know, Barbara Streisand was after him, and she, of course, was a tremendous star, and we talked about the film they made together, um, uh, I, I think, on one of our uh, earlier programs, um, What's Up Doc, which was a, a, a updated version of a screwball comedy. Um, and but the film I would like to recommend from McDonovich's oeuvre, which I think is is really, uh, I would say, a classic and beautiful, is Paper Moon, which I think is, a, you know, I think he made in 1972. Uh, it's got Ryan O'Neill, uh, but the real star, of course, is Ryan O'Neill's daughter Tatum, who won the Oscar for this phony, you know, Best Supporting Actress. You know, Yitzchak, that there were for, there were times that when they would have a child star who would do it like Bobby Driscoll or somebody else who would do an incredible uh, acting job, um, they would uh, say a special Academy Award for uh, for a child, right? As if children, you know, weren't actors, uh, and if uh, you know, as if their their job was a little bit different, so they would give special awards. I think um, I think Judy Garland received some sort of special award. I think as a child actress uh, by um, by um, Wizard of Oz, uh, but at this point, the, the the Academy understood, you know, that you can't make that difference. And um, however, uh, instead of calling her the best actress, although she's in a, she's in almost every frame of the film, uh, they called her a supporting actress, and this way they could throw her the Oscar. Uh, Tatum didn't do much afterwards. 
<laughs> I mean, she made a number of others. She was also, of course, the 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 tomboy pitcher in the Bad News Bears, which, of course, we've talked about as well as a a, a decent uh, sports film uh, with Walter Matthau in it. Um, but this film is really a, a throwback uh, to a lot of the beauty, the beautiful films uh, of the 1930s and 40s. Um, in some ways, it, it, it sort of reminds me of Preston Surges' uh, classic that we've talked about here, uh, which is Sullivan's Travels, because it really gives you a sense of the depression. It gives you a sense of poverty. You know, I saw one reviewer wrote that you get a sense of poverty like a pandemic, the way it spreads everywhere uh, and, and how it changes people. Um, and the, that was written way before COVID. But you can see in every little corner of this film how the lack of money has altered people, how the poverty that people are living in uh, really dehumanizes them. Um, and, and, and the film you know, deals with, the, with Roosevelt, at least talks about in the background about Roosevelt is pushing happiness and how the radio shows and the, um, the commercials and what people are hearing about and the songs are all about being upbeat and it's better times are coming and things are great the way they're happening and happy days are here again. And of course, it's belied by what you're seeing in front of you. Now, unlike films that were actually made in the 30s and 40s, uh, this film is able to use some curse words. It's able to use, you know, some somewhat graphic language. I remember Yitzhak when I was, uh, when I was 12. But really, it, it, the cursing is really giving it a verite of what life was like and how, you know, sort of similar to, uh, you know, but done so much better than, than you know, Woody Allen, you know, people make Woody, the Woody Allen's film called um, The Purple Rose of Cairo, where you have a depression era, uh, you know, movie starved girl um, bring some character to life. And of course, that film also was about the difference between fantasy and reality. I think you know Bogdanovich is able to get that done here without resorting to some sort of metaphysical device. You can see the difference, and you can see what's really going on. You can see there's still some some aspect of decent humanity, but you can see the way poverty and difficulty inserted itself into people throughout what's what we sometimes consider the idyllic, beautiful, sylvan you know, plain states where everybody's just a good, decent person, but you can see that everyone's trying to get a, a, a leg up off, 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 off each other. And, and, and the relationship between Tatum and Ryan, between Addie and Mose, is they become con artists. And, you know, they basically on what well, seems to be just a trip from Kansas to Missouri, they end up, of course, making various detours and ripping people off, coming up with various schemes of, uh, you know, selling Bibles to old widows, to, uh, widows who have just lost their husbands, and using emotion to to sort of get them to pay jacked up prices for these Bibles that, of course, were never ordered by their husband at all. Um, and you know, Ryan O'Neill uh, does a great job playing a scamp uh, that you don't see as, as as a real villain. In fact, I think that's one of the great parts of this film is that you know, even the 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 corrupt policeman uh, who you can see how you know, they're, they're, they're in cahoots with the bootleggers um, or the, you know, the, the farm boys that are, you know, just waiting to wrestle. They aren't grotesque monsters. Uh, Bogdanovich is very kind to his characters. Um, and, and, and of course that's the quality of the writing, but it also is the fact that, um, you know, the way he films them, uh, there, there, there are close-ups in ways that you, you, you know, he's not afraid of showing you the warts on people, but he doesn't have to turn them into monsters uh, to f- to get his point across. And there's 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 some moral ambiguity uh, in general, but I, I think in the heart of it, it's really a love story, you know, between this girl who, the reason why she meets this fellow that drives around with her is because he had shown up. At, at his mother's, at her mother's funeral, for some reason, it's clear that her mother was a loose woman in some city in Kansas, and that he was had been somewhat of a boyfriend of the mother, and he felt bad enough that he showed up uh, at the funeral, which lends the whole question: Is he her father? 
And of course, you know, Bogdanovich is having fun with this because you know when you're watching the film that it is actually a father and daughter playing what could be a father and daughter. Uh, it, it, you know, Ryan O'Neill's character consistently denies the fact that he's her father, but you see them coming close and you see how she finally finds someone. And of course, they are bonded by becoming con artists together. The simcha of doing that. I mean, uh, uh, Addie, which is, of course, Tatum's character, uh, is very generous with, you know, her. She doesn't mind ripping off these, you know, uh, these hapless uh you know, yahoos, but she's very interested in giving the money uh, to people that might need it and families that, that would need the money. So she shows the great heart of a child, even though the child is enjoying <laughs> to being very, not more than just being mischievous, but lying and stealing, cursing and smoking, but also enjoying Jack Benny on the radio and, and being, uh, you know, a very positive force um, towards the possibility that maybe there is there is goodness, despite the fact that it's encrusted over by what poverty l- lends us to do, which is to you know unfortunately for people without Torah, people without mitzvahs, you know it, it pushes them to become con artists and grifters. Still, um, you know it's got a great turn by Madeline Kahn, uh, who lost the best. She she said it wasn't fair. She said she might have won. Because she was a really just a supporting actress. She says if Tatum would have been in the best actress field, she might have won. Uh, Madeline Kahn does a great, great job. We've talked about her, of course, in the past as well. Uh, she she hits every note perfectly uh, as you know a cheap woman uh, that that is that they pick up on the way, and she, despite her her worldliness, and you know she's no match for this eight, nine-year-old girl who knows how to put her in her place and to make sure she doesn't take away the affection that she is building with this surrogate father type. There's also a, an African-American character that she befriends, and Bogdanovich, uh, again, does a, a wonderful job without uh, pandering uh, you know, to racial stereotypes and not coming off as ultra-liberal in any sort of phony way. And they and, and the friendship between uh, that character and the African American character is very laudable, and she and, and they help each other, uh, and and again also reflective of 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 what was the the relationship between white and black America at the time. So I can't, like I said, I think it's a, a film that you could probably see with uh, I don't know if you could see with the yeshivasha kids, but I think with most kids uh, they could see it and they would find strength not only in the budding relationship of, of, of between this child and, and who could be her father, but also the empowerment of children, the wisdom of children, and, to, and not just be people that are shut out by adults, but could actually sometimes give a glimpse of the way things should be, the way things ought to be. Um, and in a way, using, uh, using the, the wonderful aspect of children, it's something that we can use to, to elevate uh, our own self out of cynicism, um, <laughs> despite everything that's going out. So that's, again, I have to just say before I, uh, you know, throw it over to you, Yitzchak, you know, Bogdanovich, you know, after these three incredible films, uh, What's Up Doc, Last Picture Show, and um, Paper Moon, you know, he never really was able to hit it out of the park in the same way. Um, you know, and, and like his hero, Wells, was many and many times pushed to either being an actor <coughs> or a, uh, you know being involved in documentaries or things like that and uh <coughs> you know he 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 ruined his life admittedly by all the affairs that he had um his his, his first wife probably deserves along with Laszlo Kovacs the cinematographer um his first wife uh Polly Pratt who they were already broken up at this point or divorced. She did all the incredible um, production design. And, you know, it, it, it really does take you back, you know, 40 years into the past, uh, into the, into the, into the midst of the depression, uh, the vehicles that are used and the, and, and the way the city looks. So it, it, it's really great. I, I should tell you one of the things I like to do, Yitzhak, 
when I see a film like this that I that I think is shot so beautifully and you know has such you know, such wonderful set pieces in it, I like checking out the um, the uh, the screenplay of the film. Now, the the screenplay of the film is it's it is credited to Alvin Sargent, uh, and I it, it's available online. When I looked at the screenplay, I realized how much Bogdanovich had altered parts of it, how even the, the wonderful last shot, which should bring tears to most people's eyes, I can see how Bogdanovich, um, you know, he, he was able to take out saccharine elements of it by uh, omitting certain things. Um, you can see the screenplay is obviously the film was made from this screenplay, but you can see the choices that he made as a filmmaker. You know, the person who writes it, you've, you've seen screenplays, maybe you've written screenplays. They are written with POVs, camera shots, close-ups, you know, as, as if they are telling the director what he should do. Um, but once the director has the screenplay, of course, as Hitch and others knew, as John Ford and, uh, and knew, you're able to, you know, obviously alter it, change it. And Bogdanovich, you can see the difference. So if you really see this film, I would also recommend checking out the screenplay and you can see the, the mastery that Bogdanovich had at that time and how he was able to, to make it so much better by, by taking out what's important about Dwayne Hickman and, and the Dobie Gillis show. Well, the one thing is that the show was the first television show to focus, even though obviously uh, Hickman himself was, was out of his teens by the time he was playing Dobie Gillis. It was a character that had existed in in in, uh, in in written form already for over a decade, and there was another film with, with other actors by, uh, of the story of, of Dobie Gillis, uh, The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis. But then finally, when they made it the television show, it wasn't just Hickman himself, who we lost this week, but uh, the ensemble cast there when you had uh, certainly uh, pre-Gilligan uh, Bob Denver as Maynard G. Krebs, who was who was a a, a beatnik who was afraid to work. Uh, the any time you know one of his one of his uh, his catchphrases whenever he would hear the word work, he, he was like work, and then there, there'd be like a, a cue from the music, and it was uh, it was quite a funny funny little thing there. Um, and then you had the, his parents, uh, you know, uh, uh, Herbert and Winnie played by Frank Phelan and in, in Florida Priebus, who also, uh, you know, they were uh, ph- phenomenal characters for the whole thing. And then, uh, there was a girl, Zelda played by Sheila Cool, who, uh, ha- played that she had a crush on him, even though she was a, a tomboy and, and, a, a, in real life a lesbian, she's a politician in California now. Yeah. And other uh, Tuesday Weld was, you know, one of the, you know, beautiful uh, starlets of the time. And that was someone, one of the many girls that, that Dobie Gillis always uh, had a crush on. But it was also, it was really, uh, it, it presented teenagers in a way kind of how they really are. One of the things we were, I was, yesterday I was watching an episode of, of Dobie Gillis. So all the episodes are streaming for free on shoutfactory.com both uh, just on the computer or or on the uh, you know streaming all the stream they have their own streaming channel that you have to go through a lot of commercials to get there but it, it's there but uh, <clears throat> you know we noticed that uh, my wife pointed out you know how they throw out the word love so much because uh, a lot of teenagers they they don't exactly know what it means to be in love uh, you know, there's a kind of the puppy love, and that's really what he was expressing. You know, he didn't really uh, he he would throw that word around, not really knowing what it meant. And uh, the one episode that I watched yesterday, even though there are many episodes there, you know, it's a, it's a 147 episodes, so it's a very successful successful TV show. Um, and you know, some there's one that I probably remember the best was where they were doing some kind of experiments with chickens and they wind up making a giant chicken at the end so you have kind of a science fiction trope there but uh the one i watched yesterday was called who needs who needs elvis 
the chicken one was called the chicken from outer space, even though the chicken was not from outer space. But the the one I watched yesterday was Who Needs Elvis, which was the first episode of the second season. And in the beginning of the show, William Shallot, who who was also uh, in many other sitcoms and other movies and so forth, a very very uh, very prolific career. Uh, he was the their teacher who was teaching the band also. I think he was the English teacher as well as the band teacher. And so he was uh, trying to conduct the school band, the high school band, and being very sarcastic about it. And it was very, very interesting. And uh, the whole reason why Dovey is there in the band is because he wants to get the attention of this girl. And then, uh, and then Zelda wants to get Dovey's attention. So Zelda's there in the band and Maynard just doesn't have anything better to do, and he's in, interested in music, so he's there in the band. Uh, and uh, Doby is is relishing all of his love upon this one girl, beautiful girl sitting in front of him. And she said, "It's just not going to work." And he said, "Well, why not?" And then she stands up and shows that she's m- maybe uh, eight or nine inches taller than him. <laughs> and uh, and and it was a, a funny thing. But the but it, it, there's a certain amount of uh, progressivism there that that the uh, Doby says to her, what what difference does that make you know which you know so much in in our community in Shaduchim and there's so much <laughs> uh, there's, there's so much superficial well you could definitely be mochel you know beauty yeah, that, beauty allows you to be mochel a number yeah. of inches you know what yeah. I'm saying right. <laughs> from from so, I don't know if I would consider oh Doby is such a noble character you know what I'm saying no, no. <laughs> a tall <laughs> statuesque blonde okay yeah. <laughs> you know why not. Yeah. So, um, uh, so then uh, she, but then she winds up being interested because she's interested in uh, in um, in jazz music. So she's she's, she's more connected to she's more connected to Maynard. <laughs> yeah, she wants she wants she wants to go steady with Maynard, but he just really has no interest in girls. He just wants to be a, a, a lazy beatnik and and play his music. But then Doby figures, uh, you know, as you said, he's not a very uh, He's not a very noble character. He figures, well, how will he keep her? Is by having uh, Maynard be, be the uh, be the martyr of going steady with her, just to kind of keep her from going out with anybody else. And since he's not really interested in her, that that's going to make it, uh, you know, fine. So, he is, but meanwhile, Maynard actually gets interested in her. <laughs> so, then, so then, Zelda Maynard is he's like, still human, Maynard, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And, and Zelda comes up with an idea that that Doby should should you know perform a song ostensibly that because you know the the teacher played by William Shallot says that you know he's going to make a contest whoever can can compose a jazz composition and Doby gets up and play and sings and plays a song where he's just actually lip syncing uh, but he's ostensibly actually singing uh, that Zelda wrote for him in order. You know, she she kind of was, uh, you know, uh, martyring herself, uh, writing this song so that Dobie could could impress. Dobie Dutch would love her. her. And she sort of like Rachel giving over the Simonim to Leia. Yeah. She gives yeah. over the song to Dobie for Dobie to try to impress this 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 Amazon woman. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I hear. Uh, but then he, does, he does the right thing in the end. And it's. Uh... Realizing that that it's you know in other words, he, I think every show I guess he loses the girl right. I mean that's the point right. right? right. I, every yeah. show ends with that shtick that he loses the girl. So and he's always, he, he always, he's always sitting you know in front of a, a, a statue of the thinker of Rodin's the thinker, and someone pointed out which I never thought of was that he was really kind of the teenage version of, of Jack Benny that you mentioned Jack Benny, the the kind of deadpan humor, looking at the camera, breaking the. The, the the fourth the third wall fourth wall and uh yeah i i i, I look you know yitzchok um you know my um i grew up in a house with an older brother who remembered the Dobie Gillis show i again by the time by the time i was cognizant the show had been canceled 
1963. Yeah. But I remember my brother always talking about it and always loving it because he thought it was really wild and the plots were very wild. I remember him telling me there's a one time Bob Denver gets superpowers or something like that. I don't know. Like they had they had a thing like that. I mean, <laughs> I, I think you're you're correct. The the film, uh, the, the 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 movie in the fifties and this television show um, was really part of uh, sort of an obsession with youth culture and what was going on with them and trying to understand them. It started it before it it really opened that because meaning that became, you know, Roger Corman made all the teenage and not only Roger Corman, all the American international, they made all of these, you know, teenage movies and, that was all kind of after. Uh, I, I don't know. You, so, you know, Nicholas Ray already made, uh, you know, um, Rebel Without a Cause uh, in, in the mid fifties. Uh, there was a Blackboard Jungle. There were a lot of films, but but the difference is those films, you know, spent a lot of time with the teenagers, but also gave you the adults, especially Rebel Without a Cause, uh, and, and and that was clearly the obsession of. Of America was the juvenile delinquents, and J. Edgar Hoover opened up a whole uh, section of the FBI to try to figure out what's going on, and maybe the communists are behind the whole JD thing. But here, you know, this was, I think, uh, the beatnik era, uh, you know, ushered in something a little bit different. It wasn't that they were delinquents, but they were somehow kooky and and, and totally different. Uh, their dances were different. Um, you know, they were moving towards, I guess, a more Eastern philosophical uh, way of looking at things. Uh, it, it sort of predates what we know as the real youth cultural revolution of the mid '60s that the Beatles heralded in. So it's sort of you know it's 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 feeling the sense that the kids are becoming much more primal, um, and adults are obsessed with them. And this might be a story that this might be a program that allows children allows adults to to get a real sense of what. What's going on with these kids? Like, sort of like, you know, the, like, like Bye Bye Birdie. You know, what's the matter with kids today? Here's a, here's a program that zeroes in on them. Uh, but, you know, I, I guess not in sort of a leave it to beaver uh, sweet way. You know, there, there's an element of, of, I don't know if it's risque, but definitely, you know, there's, uh, it's not, it's not rose colored. Yeah, it, 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 you know, maybe by our standards, it could be it could be considered risque. I would say, you know, you by, know. by Froome standards. But but yeah, I say, yeah. but even in the, the in the time when it was when it became a hit show, you know, it was not it was it was meant not, not necessarily to show the the wisdom of the adults, right? I, I think part of *Liebe of Beaver* has to do with you know the adults. Um, giving you the lessons for the kids. I mean, there's a lot of time spent <laughs> with, with 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 Wally and the Beaver, but right. there's also a tremendous amount of time spent with the parents and and the interaction. The parents giving direction to those children. I don't know if in Dobie Gillis, although you talked about the actors who played the parents, the, does every program end with the parent giving the lesson, like like in Happy Days or like the first episodes of Happy Days, the first two seasons of Happy Days, or is it really? You know, this is the world of Dobie and his friends. I think yeah, it's because, you know the the father is is really uh he's a hard nosed you know very uh, difficult difficult type of dad. He's not he's not one of he's not Ward Cleaver. He's you know he's a hard working shopkeep. He own you know he owns a supermarket or a, or a grocery store, not a supermarket, a small grocery store, and that's you know and and he's not he's not a very friendly guy. He's kind of a forerunner for. You know, I, I in, in King of the Hill, you know, Hank would always say that the boy ain't right, and it was that uh, uh, you know, whereas Hank Hill was maybe a little bit more friendly to his son Bobby than than uh, than, than than this character is. But it was it was really, uh, you know, obviously this was someone who had served in World War Two and you know came back, and now he's trying to you know live the American dream and everything, and and he has to deal with this, uh, you know, his son who just wants money and and uh you know doesn't doesn't really uh respect him doesn't really appreciate everything that he does for him and so it's uh it, it it's it's definitely a very uh different different type it's much more gritty much more while still being goofy and funny um but it doesn't not- necessarily it doesn't necessarily uh, explore that relationship in any sort of deep way um, you know, I, I think, you know, the, the you know, um, 
Zelda's character, and you know, she was an actress. You know, Sheila Cool. They, there was actually a lot of talk mm-hmm. about a spinoff program for her. Uh, they were going to have a, a a series called Zelda after Dobie was canceled, or maybe even while Dobie was running. Uh, mm-hmm. But you know, the the network thought that despite the fact that you know she pines for Dobie, that she did give off this this atmosphere, give off these vibes <laughs> that maybe she was a lesbian. So, and you know, and, and again, she was. But but I think that she. I agree with you that she is a character that, along with Bob Denver, uh, really help the program be anything of significance i can't tell you that i think Dwayne hickman although he had a you know like a, a career in hollywood beforehand and he had done a lot of it was on the bob cummings show and as, as uh, one of the main uh actors in there you know but you know i mean hickman like i said after gillis was was canceled you know he was in a couple of uh there's a number of beach movies with uh with frankie avalon and ed Finicello. i think he was in hottest stuff a wild bikini I think he was in that. I don't know, I forgot what I'm not sure what part he played in that. But yeah, you know, he really, you know, he he, he really did not uh, do much afterwards. Um, I, Price, was, was Vincent Price in that one also? Or I don't you know, had the look and he he wasn't scary for America. And yet he was giving America, I guess, a glimpse into into what teenagers were about and and you know their their, their love life and what have you. Um I, d- I don't think the program could have lasted without De- Bob Denver and and uh, you know I, I think Bob Denver you know had a very long career afterwards. Uh, I think many people believe that the Maynard was a was a, a character that really was sort of like the Fonz and in, in later in Happy Days, a character that was so goofy but somehow was in a way a greater purveyor of wisdom than almost anybody else on the show, whereas as Gilligan. You know, he plays basically a complete doofus who, you know, is, is almost simple minded. Um, I think if here's what I would ask you, if Maynard met Gilligan, I think Maynard would not want to hang out with Gilligan too much. What no, I don't think so either. No, I, I would agree with that. And I would say he would, he would I, consider. I, and Bob Denver played a lot of he played Gilligan in a lot of other shows, meaning even if it wasn't Gilligan. Right. Tales. He was right. Bob Denver. And I think. You know, Hickman. And it's a shame because that that he was typecast because he had he had much more of a range. Uh, there was there was a TV show called uh, Fractured Flickers with um, Hans Conried was a in these these two sitcoms. Uh, I think in the uh, American cultural memory bank, you know, Gilligan looms larger. You know, Gilligan's Island looms larger, and I think it's um, a part of it has to do, I think, with the um, although. Both of these programs, you know, had the basics, you know, let's start with a thing and they don't get off the island. Dobie doesn't get the girl. Um, I think this, you know, feeds into what I was saying about what America wanted in terms of, you know, just something that was strange beyond something that, you know, really isn't going to happen. Plus, you know, a certain goofiness of, of almost every single character. Uh, that was on the island, and I think that was part of the reason why you know people loved Bob Denver in that role. Um, and I, obviously, I don't know how much he got on the um, residuals on the reruns, but I think if you do a, a if you do a survey, you'll find that the residuals of Gilligan's Island ran for you know <laughs> probably about a hundred times more than Dobie Gillis. Because, like you say, you have to hurt, you have to hunt for Dobie Gillis. I think you'll probably find Gilligan playing almost anywhere, but about him uh and talked about his presence and his his uh, tremendous acting chops his ability to really and uh, you know really almost dominate a scene uh and and the significance of what he means for um uh, af- the african american community um i think it's a you know somewhat of a of a shame that in some of the retrospectives um you know, they almost have the the people that are extolling him are almost all African Americans, um, as if only African Americans could appreciate him. Um, and one of the things, that, of course, makes him great is that he was able to bridge and be a, a breakout star beyond the African American community. Not to the point that you didn't know he was black, but that you didn't care. He, he and he actually played a character in a number of films where he is struggling against white society or 
Um, and he mentions that it's not like a post-racial character, but clearly, you know, Poitier uh, had a, 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 a perch that almost no other actor uh, inhabited in the African-American of the African-American actors. And there were so many wonderful Canada Lee and, and, and others that were really you know, great, great actors. But Poitier for years was almost the, the this dominant force. But as I said, I think that uh, that it's it was sad to me that the retrospectives were only given from people of of of, of who saw him as representative of their community. I, I think when we talk about films, I think this is you know Bogdanovich was was no tzaddik. He was a Russia in many ways, and he admitted it in terms of the way he dealt with with his wife and and, and leaving a number of wives for for the next blonde starlet. Um, uh, you know, you know the uh, you know, there's there's no question about it that you know, we're not talking about um, you know significant people, but but as Bogdanovich understood, loving a film, you don't have to come from a certain place and from a certain background to be able to extol and understand people from a certain place and and, and what their contribution is. I think the more we hear <laughs> what everyone thought about Poitier, the the greater we understand. I wouldn't say the loss. He hasn't been involved in filmmaking for years. He hasn't really been uh, a presence and done anything. But to appreciate what he did, and I I, I would like to hear more of what you know, the, what what everybody would say, you know, about stuff. And I think both of us share what we consider this. This era, uh, this this uncomfortability with this era that we're living in, that that we, you know, it's almost like okay, well, uh, you know, uh, if we want to talk about Buddy Hackett, you have to be Jewish, you know. What I'm saying, like, you know, so somehow it doesn't work for us, right? You know, you know, yeah, no, can, in you, fact, you, just the opposite. You get in trouble if you if you suggest that, that you're upset that that someone who's uh, you know who's a Helen Mirren is playing uh, Golda Meir, well. That's different. That that that's acceptable. It's just it's not acceptable for for a white actor to play Doctor Hibbert, or or we we can't even have we can't even have uh, Apu anymore because it, it's it's too offensive. You know? Right, right. And so, so so I think it's unfortunate how frozen out we are, um, you know, uh, in that way. I mean, you think about someone like Poitier, who you know was able to, um, yeah. He wasn't just oh he was in this one film he he was with Spencer Tracy Glenn Ford Richard Widmark um, Paul Newman uh, he was in films and shared a top building with all of these actors um, and um, you know he was part of that glorious you know era you know, of you know, the, the last great period of you know of, of Hollywood studio films in the 1950s and 60s. And I think that, um, you know, there's a, uh, you know, the, it, it, he needs to be recognized uh, for his body of work, for his contribution to these, to, to old movies and to films generally. I don't want to, like Bogdanovich would say, you know, to, to great films in general. Um, I think that, uh, you, know, you know, to me, uh, you know, you know, I, I have used his films um, especially to stir with love, to stir with love. I'm sorry, sure, sure. to stir with love. I got mixed up there. To stir with love. I've used that film uh, when I tried to speak to my classes uh, when I was teaching high school. You know, I would show them, uh, you know, Poitier's uh, his first teaching uh, st- station. You know, when he was before he changes things, and I would ask them, okay, what did he do wrong? Why was he an effective teacher? What should he have done? And my students would tell me, uh, anticipating the changes Portier himself makes in the film to become a successful teacher in a tough uh, West End, uh, London, you know, West End of London high school. And um, you know, it's a very again, it's it's. I wouldn't say it's a uh, it, it, it's 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 a very tempered, restrained performance, uh, but you see his his angst. And not as a black man of any teacher. Um, the fact that he's black is really somewhat irrelevant. The main thing is is that um, is that how does a teacher learn how to connect to students? How do you make things relevant? 
how do you uh, what's considered real expectations so i think for 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 teachers and for students uh, you know to serve with love is is really a standout film um you know, and it, 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 again yeah I, it, it, very little objectionable material is in it and i think for any rebbe who is having a problem with you know discipline um maybe even for parents who are who are struggling with how can they you know their their kids are out of control what, what can they do shouting isn't helping screaming isn't helping what are the, what's what's the methods that work i think you can you can you could definitely go to uh, to serve with love and i don't think it'll be as i think what makes it so effective is is an portier's portrayal which shows his intelligence and the difference of approach changing the idea of i'm going to do it this way we're going to do it a different way you can see the wheels turning in his head and he does that just by the looks that he gives to the camera the way he stares out not many actors are able to do that not many many actors can read lines um you know not so many actors. I don't even think Olivier was able to do that as well. I mean, Olivier was incredible in, in line reading and being able to 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 you know, to, use, to to assume a certain character. But a movie star is able just by looking out the window in a certain way to somehow give over what's going on in his internal what what's going on in the internal mechanism. Well, I mean, we don't have you know in, in... that. that that the great ones have right tracy had it um yeah, yeah. You, you know bogart had it some in, in in many of his films not all of them but right. you know it, it isn't just Spencer tracy's definitely had it he, you right. know, his it, he would just he, he he didn't have to say anything that's it, right it like that, you could that see bridging that we were speaking about last week about the between the silent film and the talkie you know where you know again okay, you can see that the fritz lang film that trace that that tracy was in fury which we've talked about yeah. before you you can see you know tracy um even in dr jekyll and mr hyde which is not uh, such a great version of it that with tracy in it you know tracy's yeah. able tracy was able to do a tremendous amount or even in justice in nuremberg where yeah. he is walking and, and thinking about what's what's going on in the trial um tracy had it portier has it um, you know, you, you can see it in some of them. And I think that's really the special gift that the directors like Bogdanovich and others are able to capture on film. They're able to capture that. And of course, using lighting techniques and other things to, to bring that out. <coughs> there's a certain, in, the, the talent of the actor to grasp what it is that's going on and what's asked for them to, to imitate that. And to be able to project it in sort of an exaggerated way that the audience picks it up, but not in a way that they need it to be, they need exposition to explain it. Um, that they have to, like, you know, like talking to the dog or something like that. Oh, you know, what's going on inside their mind. And that is something that I think, that, you know, Poitier shows in, in To Serve With Love and in, in The Heat of the Night and, 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 and many of his other, uh, many, of his, many of the other things that he was in. Uh, and that way, again, he's sort of like, it, it, I wouldn't call him, in my mind, I wouldn't even, I don't even, I was, oh, he's this, this great black actor. He is, he's just a great actor. He's he just a great a, actor. He, yeah. he, he is a great actor who, who br- you know, he, he gave a lot of credit to a co-worker. He was, he was, he came from uh, what, what, one of the islands in the, in, in the Jamaica or something. He, he had a very thick accent. And he was working as a, you know, washing dishes in a restaurant. And he said that it was a, an older Jewish man who was a, a waiter there at the restaurant who taught him how to read, help him, you know, be able to to uh, imitate an American accent. And because he wanted to act, but he just it, he didn't have because he couldn't even read. So how could he how could he act? He had this dream of being an actor and he, he wasn't able to do it. And it was this. It was this uh, this old Jewish man who who was his coworker, who saw that potential in him and and uh, put in time. He he saw him with the newspaper and he was struggling and he said, you know, uh, we're every night we're going to sit and we're going to read together. I'm going to read with you and teach you how to read. And uh, that was and 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 they spent weeks and weeks and weeks every night 
dedicated to this until he was able to read. And then once he could read the newspaper, he could read his lines and, and, and <laughs> Yeah, and, and deliver them and deliver them with uh, with great intelligence. Uh, again, yeah. if, if anybody is, is is interested, if they don't want to listen to podcasts on their way, um, the there I'm sure there's available on Audible or in their libraries a a great um, book on tape, which is called The Measure of a Man, which is Poitier's autobiography. Um, but it isn't like just boring names and dates. He really, you could really hear his philosophy of what it means to be a, a good human being and to be, uh, and, and he reads it. So it, 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 it's definitely worthwhile to hear him read his own words. And you know, it wasn't ghost. It wasn't a ghost written one either. So, as we say, watch your step on the way out. We'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us for another episode from the Yeshiva of Newark at IDT Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a single episode.